stopping and take it away. All right, good afternoon or good morning. I hope that this presentation finds you well. My name is Corey and I'm the arborist for ArborJet out here in the Rocky Mountain High Plains territory. We have staff and arborists all over the country. And if you see somebody out there that you have not yet met and you fall into that region, um, please give them, a, give them a reach out at the end of this presentation. Just say, hey, I saw, the, I saw the presentation or if you have any questions along the way, please jot them down, jot the individual's name down and we'll help you get in touch with uh, the respective field support agent. So this presentation and this topic really came up because we talked to hundreds of different arborists and landscapers out there, whether it's municipal or the private sector. And our industry has one big problem. It's got a lot of problems, but it's got one big problem. And that seems to be, according to Forbes at least, uh, the lack of unfilled jobs. For, for many of you out there who are responsible for hiring, you're gonna find it uh, pretty commonplace to put a job out there and have a handful of applicants if you're lucky, but to find skilled labor that can do that job and do that job well is becoming increasingly difficult. If you look, and I know this, this data is from 2009, but if you look back at this, you could probably see that that trend is going the direction that it has been. For the amount of openings there are, there aren't as many hires coming in. And you could blame it on a number of different things. Um, it could be a generational thing. It could be just a cultural thing. But it is an issue that we have to deal with. And whether or not um, you face the employment crisis yet and filling those spots, you sure will. Yeah, it's just a matter of time. Almost every company out there, and I know going into the fall, it's a little bit trickier, but almost every company out there at one time or another will post multiple job openings and oftentimes to no avail. So what are these companies doing and what are other companies doing to make the most of the labor force that you have? And if you're a business owner, you know one of your most expensive things is hiring the right people, training them, and then bringing them up to speed only to let them go at the end of the season. So that, that can be pretty expensive um, and it can take up a lot of time. So with that labor pool that you have, how can you make the most of it? We're gonna talk about plant growth regulators and the idea, at least the, the forward most idea of that would be that we could reduce labor because if you apply these products, then you're not gonna to have to show up and prune or trim or um, whatever you're doing as it relates to uh, landscape maintenance as often. So traditionally what you would do, uh, especially if you're in the Midwest or maybe the Rocky Mountain region, is you'd show up in the spring and you'd do a shear and shape event. You'd come back three to four weeks later, three to four weeks later, and three to four weeks later. And this can do a couple of things. It, it gets you on site, but it can also take up that time and those valuable man hours. So what we're proposing, or at least something we would invite you to entertain, would be that if you could just show up in the spring, do that shearing and shaping event, spray it with the plant growth regulator, and then maybe come back six to eight weeks later, instead of doing this whole big shear and shape again, all you're gonna have to do is do some tipping back, maybe remove some of those runaway or rogue sprouts, and then hit it again, come back a couple months later and do that shaping event again. Uh, especially this time of year. Um, once again, labor is hard to come by. So if you could have made the most of it throughout the summer, uh, it would take you a lot further into the year. And I would suggest, or at least offer that if, if you're in warmer regions than the Midwest or than the Rocky Mountain region, you probably have crews going out more often than that. So as a case study, we're doing some work on American holly, which is a moderately uh, fast growing species over there in South Carolina. With our team member, he was monitoring this and he found that last or two years ago, pardon me, in 2018, he was watching a crew, discussing the options with them and they did four shearing and shaping events in basically the 16 week summer. I'm sure they did a little bit more outside of that, but these are the ones that at least they were monitoring. 
there were eight man hours per trip, which comes out to 32 man hours for the season. Now this picture that you see is not the hedge that they had spent 32 man hours in a season. That would be absurd. So in 2019, they played with this a little bit. And they found that after that initial spring prune or trim, they were able to come back and do three light tip pruning events over the course of that same 16 weeks. Those trips, because they were moving a lot less debris, were only two man hours a trip. This resulted in six man hours per season. Now there are two schools of thought with this. The first one is, well, Corey, we get paid to be on site. Uh, we get paid by the hour. What's this doing? Well, this frees up your time and your man hours to go take care of other properties or go magnify other sites. There's also probably a pool of people who are looking at this going, we get paid to maintain that property, whether it's 20 hours, 40 hours, it doesn't matter. We have the contract to maintain that property. So this is where it's probably going to benefit you, at least from the growth regulation sector. So the product we're going to discuss today and how that individual was able to achieve those results was with Shortstop 2SC. Now let's not get bogged down in the name of the product. The SC just stands for Suspended Concentrate. And the two, well, that's two pounds of active in that one gallon container. The active is Paclobutrazole, which is 22 and a third percent. And at this point in the presentation, I'd like to point out Paclobutrazole. So look at that azole. That's gonna become very important, especially as we dig into some of the secondary benefits of using these products. This is sold as a plant growth regulator. So depending on what state you're in and what your Department of Agriculture requires of you, this is how it shall be labeled on your estimate and on your work order. And we sell this as, or you could sell this as a soil application for trees, but as of this summer, there's actually a soil or foliar spray for shrubs. And we'll get into that more towards the end of the presentation. So how this product works, at least when you soil apply it, the tree pulls it up just like it would water and nutrients, things like that. And where this product is gonna accumulate is in those apical meristems or the buds. If you are foliarly spraying this product, it's important that you hit every single one of those buds that we're trying to regulate. Okay, that makes sense? We'll talk about more on why this is important when we get to the, um, the treatment part of the program, but you just understand that you apply this product, this is where all the magic is going to at least start to happen. Because there are two changes that do happen within the plant. The first change is there's a reduction in gibberellic acid. So for those of you who have forgotten their high school or college biology, gibberellic acid is what's responsible for cell elongation. So if we reduce it, there's going to be less elongation. The result of that for you means that you're going to be doing less pruning, it's going to give you more time savings and then more money savings because you're not going to have to spend as much time pruning and then you're also not going to have to spend as much time getting rid of that debris. The second change that occurs in the plant would be an increase in abscisic acid. Now this is what's required as a cell or a, as a plant protection hormone. So when there's an increase in abscisic acid, we're going to see a lot more disease resistance, drought resistance, and an overall improved appearance. So if you just think about that for one second, um, you may have heard that nothing in the universe can be created or destroyed. All energy must go somewhere. Well, that's kind of the same within the plants. We're taking energy out of, out of growth and putting it back into the plant so that it can allocate it where it needs it. It's actually pretty cool stuff. So that primary change, that reduction in growth that we're gonna talk about first, um, it's going to be species specific, whether you're soil applying or foliarly spraying this. That's why we have such a developed label. But we're doing some work with Michigan State, and they found that if they could just do one treatment of this in the spring, they would be showing up to do less pruning, shearing, shaping, their man hours went further, and there was less debris to clean up. Now, if you live in the West or the Rocky Mountain region, Debris disposal is a pretty big issue. Unless you have a tub grinder connection with somebody who does a lot of burning, it's almost impossible to get rid of this stuff. 
so if you could cut down on how much debris you're throwing back, um, it could take you pretty far. A lot of growth regulators struggle to regulate the growth of evergreens. However, with short stop, it actually works pretty nicely. Once again, if you can prune, save time, save money. As an arborist, I'm looking at this shrub hedge going, if I can only show up once a year and just shear this back or shape this back, I'm happy as can be, especially if it's near a sidewalk or something like that. For Scythia, I believe this was done as a soil application one year after treatment. Untreated versus control or versus treated. The difference is, is pretty amazing, especially, and we're looking at growth regulation here, but especially if you start looking at those secondary changes, you can see greener waxier leaves on the right. So everyone's situation is going to be different, and we can't talk about every species and how it's affected by growth regulation. But if you could think about where using a plant growth regulator to help cut back on some of the pruning or shearing or shaping, um, we'd love to hear about it. Reach out to one of those tech managers that we were talking about earlier and see if you can't set up a little mini trial or demo or something. In this instance in Arizona, um, the homeowner or the management company at least didn't want to show up, shear, shape, rake, and then skim the pool trying to clean it all up. So that was just one instance, um, but I'm sure in each and every market you're going to have your own. In our industry, the, the green industry, the tree and landscape industry, the most dangerous thing is probably a power tool. In this case, a, a chipper or a chainsaw. And anybody can go on to YouTube and figure out how to use that chainsaw to shear a hedge. Now, that's probably not the right way to go about doing things. But in our industry, uh, this is a serious thing. Safety is big. And there's nothing in our industry that's more dangerous than a power tool. Well, maybe a ladder. Or a ladder and a power tool. This stuff really happens. All right, so let's talk about some of those secondary changes. We discussed how the growth regulation would save you time and money, but let's look at what's happening from a tree physiologist, from, from an arborist perspective on what's actually changing or occurring within the plant. So the first thing that we could talk about, especially like we were discussing earlier, we've been in a drought, we're always in a drought. It seems like every summer from July till August till September, we're just lacking rain. So some of the research that was done, and this goes, this goes back 13, 14 years ago, but some of the research that was done talks about how if you apply paclobutrazole, the active ingredient, you're actually going to see a useful degree of drought tolerance. Now think about it from the tree's perspective. What, what is happening when you are applying this product? Well, you're getting a thicker waxier leaf. So that leaf is not going to transpire or give off as much moisture as it would otherwise. We were doing some research at what folks in Colorado call church. Of course, you all know it as a whole foods market. And coming out of the market and working with this team, you can look across the parking lot, especially between the whole foods and uh, who was next door. And you could see that the trees just weren't very pretty. And this was like, middle summer. Why are trees turn yellow? Why are they dropping all their leaves in like July? What's going on? Well, they're drought stressed. So we turn the camera over and we want to focus on these two trees that were looking completely fried. Uh, this is back in 2017. Completely fried. And they are uh, little leaf linden trees. So completely fried. What we did was we treated the tree on the left and the tree on the right we left as a control. Well, Two years later, it was pretty obvious what tree had received the treatment. You can see that the linden on the right is still pretty torched out. And uh, I have not gotten out there this summer to take a look at it, but I would suspect since I was in 2017, I would suspect that the product is probably worn off now as it has a three year treatment interval and that that tree on the left would be due for retreatment. But if you're putting your name behind caring for this landscape, or maybe you or some of your clients have some premature leaf drop, uh, especially as it relates to drought stress, this might be something to explore. 
Now, if we take a little bit closer look at those leaves, what you'll find is that the untreated leaves got a little crispy around the edges. Those treated leaves look pretty good. And for those who have not yet actually felt leaves that have been treated with shortstop, you'll find that it's actually uh, waxing, almost has like a leather touch to it. Um, of course, you'd probably have to be somebody who's fully immersed in this industry and seeing these plants daily to tell the difference. But uh, to the untrained eye, um, they won't be able to tell a the difference. They'll just know that it looks great unless you leave a control, of course. Another photo taken, this is uh, from Boulder, Colorado. And you can just see it's a parking lot tree. It's got <laughs> these rock mulch, even the thing. It's got rocks all around it. So the pH is all funky. This is a tree that would be rather growing in like Wisconsin or Minnesota with a lower pH. Well, we treated it with shortstop as well as with our chelated iron and manganese product. And by the next year, it looked phenomenal. And I like to point out to the folks in uh, the background that if you look at the turf in the background between one year and the next, it's much, much browner in the second photo. So we took that same Minjet FE, which is our, our iron and manganese chelated product, and we added it to the shortstop product. We did those treatments in the same year. So that's how we got these results, but that's also how we got these results on maples. Um, does anyone have any autumn blade maples out there? I know I was looking at where people were tuning in from yesterday and it would appear that you probably do. So I would uh, suggest that, that you look into at least this combination, this one, two hit. Yeah, the results, the results of doing those two uh, treatments are just absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. And, you know, typically this time people ask, well, Corey, you know, a lot of these autumn blaze maples or some of these other maples that have, we're putting in, they, they do fine for five, six years. They're still small diameter, small caliper. Um, do you have to retreat? Well, the label on both of those products is going to tell you to retreat in two to three years. But I've seen a number of maples that have been treated just once and they seem to have kicked that. So stay tuned. We were playing with this for, once again, for improved appearance in Scottsdale, Arizona this summer as well. And we found that the untreated ficus trees kind of got a little leggy and their growth was a little bit yellow. Um, and this was, I don't know, about six or eight weeks after treatment. Um, we then uh, took, some, took some photos, took some leaves back into the car and noted that um, the leaves on the left were untreated, the leaves on the right treated, Wish I would have taken a photo about three hours later because the tree that the tree that was treated, those leaves were still green and for the most part straight. The ones on the right or on the left that were untreated were all wilted and, and shriveled up. And uh, once again, that wasn't even an experiment. It was just I forgot I left them on the dashboard, you know, in 116 degree heat. But it was cool to see and uh, to actually feel the difference between the leaves was pretty pretty awesome too. So for any folks out there dealing with shrubs, uh, back in the Midwest, uh, spirea is a big one. You can see sometimes they just, especially if they're in irrigation so much, they just get leached out of all the nutrients. But if you can hit it early in the spring, um, you know, with the fertilizer as well as with a foliar spray of shortstop, you're going to see some 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 pretty great results. And then boxwood. Once again, the Midwest, winter damage, winter desiccation is, is going to be a big thing, um, especially if people are blowing out the irrigations right now. What, what would be something that next year you could offer maybe a little bit earlier? Treat it on the right. So as it relates, especially to this um, less winter damage, winter desiccation is when you apply this product, it's, it's primarily going to affect the new growth. So if you're looking to um, reduce winter desiccation, this might be something that you would do either as a spray uh, or as a soil application early in the spring to get those results, okay? If you show up and do that spray right now, chances are that plant's probably not putting out a whole lot more growth going into the winter, so you're probably not gonna see those results. Some more research that was conducted, and this even goes back 20 years. So when I'm talking to people, when we're listening to people and they're saying, Corey, we don't use plant growth regulators. We want to prune that stuff. We want to trim that stuff. 
Well, here's another secondary effect to using paclobutrazole or shortstop. 20 years ago, they did some research and found that the fungicidal activity uh, could actually help manage some woody plant diseases. And this is once again, where we'll go back to uh, that chemical name, right? Paclobutrazole, azole. Think about your azoles. If you're, um, if you're a pesticide individual out there, you know that if it says azole on it, it's probably a fungicide. So that's where some of this is helping. Not only is it going to help because it has that azole, but it's also making a thicker, waxier leaf. So it's going to help resist some of those funguses a little bit better, or some of those fungi a little bit better. For the folks who, who try really, really hard to try to get their homeowners to change their irrigation patterns, the first thing, especially with powdery mildew, which is a foliar fungus, the first thing that folks should do is, is make sure that the irrigation is just hitting the roots. It's not going all over the leaf because that's just going to spread the fungus. But if you can also um, train them or, or maybe start experimenting with some of these growth regulators, you'll find that as a foliar spray in the early spring, you can get some pretty good disease resistance, even on some of these tough foliars. What about black? What about black spot on roses? I haven't seen this for a while because we don't have a whole lot of moisture or foliar fun fungi out here in the West. But I know that some folks are playing with this. And once again, the results are, are pretty good. Because remember, if it's a foliar fun fungus, how it's spreading is water's hitting the leaf surface and it's moving those spores to nearby leaves. So we can create a thicker, waxier cuticle. It's going to resist those spores. So it's not going to be able to spread. Pretty neat. If you're taking care of a property, I would imagine that you would be happier to put your name behind the treated photo on the right than the treated or than the untreated on the left. So another foliar fungus that a lot of folks see across the country is called apple scab. And historically, that's one of those foliar fungi where if you decide to treat it, you're going to show up and you're going to do two, maybe three sprays in the spring as those leaves are elongating. Well, as we discussed earlier, labor is really hard to get. And if you've been doing this a while, you know that timing these things is extremely hard. Not just to time one treatment, but the time two or three on that 10 to 14 day interval it can be really, really difficult. So some of the research that was done 10 years ago on this found that you could actually control some of this stuff just by doing one application. So as a soil application, for instance, for apple scab, you could do one application and have the results last for three years. So instead of showing up and trying to time things properly for three years in a row, so three, three times three, so nine trips, why not hit it in the fall or really early spring with one soil app of bacrobutrazole? But the other thing on this paper talks about cytospora canker. So the cytospora canker that they're referring to in this study is actually with blue spruce, Colorado blue spruce as well. So here's, here's the apple scab photo. Treated on the right, see that, that thicker, darker green? Left, untreated. Okay. So let's get back to the cytospora canker. For folks who haven't seen this yet, it's extremely common, um, more so in the Midwest than out here in the Rockies, but it, it certainly has its place. A really easy way to diagnose this in the field is if you look for those cankers, you'll actually see a blue hue uh, to that sap that's coming out. Okay, so that, that's a pretty good field indicator that that's what it is. Another thing that folks commonly uh, mistake this with would be hail damage. However, if it's on the bottom side of the branch, that would be some pretty intense hail. So if left untreated, what this research paper by Dr. Watson is just pointing out, if, if left untreated over the course of a year or two, what's going to happen is that fungus is just going to proliferate. It's going to spread throughout the tree. What they also found is that even at relatively low rates of shortstop, it seemed to keep that, that fungus in check. Now, this is either because the product is pacobutrazole, azol, right? It has some of those fungicidal properties, or it may have to do with the plant's ability to put on more fibrous roots so that I can seek out 
more water. As folks may or may not know, cytospora canker is a disease that is exacerbated by drought. So the drier it is, the more that disease is going to spread. But either way, the results are pretty conclusive. If you have cytospora canker on spruce, go ahead, hit it with some shortstop, uh, maybe consider getting it into a low nitrogen fertilizer plant, and you should be able to at least get some level of control on that plant. Well, for folks in the West and Midwest, you're probably also wondering about, well, cytospora canker, what about, what about that on poplars, on aspens and cottonwoods? And I can tell you with confidence that we have a couple trials going on right now. It appears to be helping, but it's extremely hard. It's extremely hard to tell, especially if cytospora gets into the main stem. Uh, at that point, you know, it, it might be worth just basal pruning. But it's fun to have uh, to experiment and play with stuff like this. So maybe you have a disease or a fungus that you would like to play with it on. We would highly encourage it. And if you want to get any of us involved, we'd be happy to help. I know thyronectria, which uh, will happen in locusts, is another internal canker that uh, we're playing with right now. And once again, it's looking good until it gets in the main stem. So one of the more common questions that folks have or uh, instances is folks will have used these products or this active ingredient before and they've over-regulated. Well, let's just discuss it in a little bit more detail right now. Every species is gonna react slightly different to this active ingredient. This is a product that has been used in the turf industry and in golf for many, many years, actually, but they're using significantly lower rates. I mean, milliliters to gallons, almost nothing in there to get, to get grass regulated. The number one problem that folks have as it relates to overregulation is probably when they mix it up in a five gallon bucket and try to apply it onto the tree. If it runs off and comes into contact with the turf, it will turn it bright white, and probably kill it. Um, what most folks do in this instance is they, first off, why do you have turf growing right up to the base of the tree? So it's a great time to offer some of your other services. We, you actually did the tree a favor. The second thing that folks will do is they'll go in with a, with a shovel and actually physically remove some of, that, some of that white turf, give it a tree ring, throw some mulch around it. Or if it's a high dollar client um, who doesn't want anything to do with mulch, they'll just replant it right then and there. There are a couple species as well that are extremely sensitive as it relates to trees and shrubs. The one that comes to mind is Japanese maple. Uh, Japanese maple, if you even open that bottle near this plant, you're going to regulate it. So this was something we were playing with uh, over in Utah last year. And yeah, we, we like I said, we were playing with it in the name of science. But it was kind of cool because the Samaras were actually bigger than the leaves. Uh, but yeah, that's a Japanese maple. It's, it's nothing that exclusively gets grown in uh, Colorado or the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> All right, so if you do happen to overregulate, don't panic. Remain calm. If you go online, we have this technical bulletin that you can pull up. If you just Google ArborJet shortstop, click on the technical bulletin, it'll show you, it'll walk you through what you should do. It happens, it happens. If at that point you're still a little nervous, a little shaky, uh, maybe you've got a slightly upset homeowner, just call us directly. We're happy to talk you off a ledge. Um, or you can reach out to one of our distribution partners and they will also help talk you off a ledge. So we're here to support you. As we set the expectation for you that this will regulate growth and it is species specific, just realize that especially as a foliar spray, we're not gonna be able to hit every single bud every time. In this instance, you will see runaways. So maybe those buds weren't formed all the way when we sprayed it. Maybe they didn't even form till after. Perhaps the product didn't get on thick enough. I'm not sure. But what we can tell you is that you will get runaways where they're not going to be regulated. So, but wouldn't you rather show up a month or two months later? And just either use your felt coes or you know, your hedge trimmer and just knock out a couple of those um, little runaways instead of shearing and shaping the whole thing. 
I think it would be a better, better use of your time. So how do we apply this stuff? First, we'll talk about trees and then we'll get into shrubs. I know a couple of folks left some questions uh, via LinkedIn the other day uh, just around this. So we'll, we'll briefly touch on it. Trees, the most common thing that we need to tell folks is that although each tree species or many tree species will get a different rate, the ratio is always the same. We always, always, always mix it at 11 to one. So that'll equal 12 parts. And that, that's important. We'll talk about that in a second. For trees, you can either do this as a moat or a drench, just kind of dig a little uh, two or three inch deep moat all around the tree and apply the product that way. You could also use a probe if it is calibrated extremely accurately. You could use a probe and put it three to four inches deep. And we're not going out at the drip line with this. We're going within about 18 inches of that main stem, okay? 18 inches within that trunk. Make sure you're applying it evenly. Watch out for stem girdling roots, things like that. And then see the label. Can't tell you how many people uh, call up just wanting to know the rates. All I can tell you is Google it. Go to arborjet.com slash shortstop and you'll see the table with all the rates on it. And it's gonna look something like this. So if we're looking at the rates there, that's gonna talk about uh, how much product we're putting down per tree size. So if you're pulling up a number here that you see, so any number on there, it's all mixed at that 11 to one ratio. So if you're only treating one or two trees and you're just gonna mix up those individually, just take the number you see in the box, divide it by 12, that's gonna tell you how much active ingredients you need. The rest is water. It's very simple. Where you're applying it, in case you'd like to see a visual on it, as close as you can get to the trunk. And once again, this will be on the label. So if you have any questions, please direct that either towards the label or feel free to fire it to one of us technical managers. For those who have not done a drench before, uh, it's a low tech way of applying the product. It, and that's what it looks like. I mean, you literally mix it up in a five gallon bucket, keep it agitated, put it down. Super simple. And those results should last for about three years. So this is where it gets a little bit more technical. How do you foliarly uh, apply or mix or dose this, this product? And the easiest way is just to look at the image on the right. That's gonna talk about how do we find the volume? So if you go back to some of your uh, math classes that you might've taken in your earlier years, remember uh, length times width times, times height. It's, it's, it's that simple. And that'll tell you how many cubic feet you have, okay? So we'll take that and look at the label. It'll tell you what species and then how to mix by gallon for that amount. So if you're doing that foliar application, this is the only time where you're not mixing at that 11 to one ratio. You're using concentrate for that. We recommend the label permits or suggest that you use a non-ionic surfactant. So either kinetic or a 90-10, uh, audible, something like that should get you dialed in pretty well. Big thing too is to keep this agitated, which you'll see on the label as well as the cover of this product is that it's gonna stay, uh, shake well before mixing. Well, once you mix it, if you are doing a big batch, make sure you're keeping it agitated. If you're using a backpack sprayer, you'll find that just by walking around is gonna keep it agitated. And if you're doing a, a larger uh, truck or tank, maybe you have a 150 or 200 gallon tank that you're using this on, um, just make sure you keep that agitation on. Uh, jet will do just fine. You do not need paddle agitation for this product. Remember that one gallon of solution. So once it's all mixed up, we'll cover about three to 400 cubic feet. And that's just a quick little note, some for you to reference. As it relates to a soil drench, here are a handful of plants on the label. If you would like a more updated label for shrubs, uh, contact us, contact your tech manager. We'll be sure to get you one. And then as it relates to the foliar spray, um, this is what we're looking at. So you can find this we, on our website. We also will have this updated as, as we progress. But uh, all the technical managers can get you a copy of this pretty easy. So the technique on how to spray, this is extremely important, uh, especially as it is a newer product for a lot of folks. 
So make sure when you're spraying this product that you're spraying to drip. Remember, we want to see it white all over and actually dripping down from the plant. Make sure you're getting even coverage. Oftentimes, if that plant is butt up against the building, uh, make sure that you're going all the way around it as best you can, uh, covering all the woody stems. And then once again, the buds, that's, that's the key point is to, to cover the buds. In order to minimize product loss, we would highly suggest that you apply in the morning or late afternoon. Not during the heat of the day, um, not when it's super windy out. And if you can apply it in high humidity, chances are that product's gonna stick and last a little bit longer. The other results will be a little bit better. But in our case out in the West, we're frequently in single digit humidity. So um, just make sure you're using that non-ionic surfactant and doing it during those off, off peak hours. Something we will say too at this point is we're spraying to drip. And if you live in the if you live in the West or maybe you, you're going through a drought and you have this as a foliar spray, what you will notice is that there's going to be little, little insignificant white spots kind of peppered throughout the plant. Uh, that's not something we typically see in the Midwest or on the East Coast, just because you get a higher amount of precip, but it is something to note. And um, in order to actually see those white spots you'd have to be pretty close. Your, your face would almost have to be in the plant, which if you have lantana, totally fine to put your face in that plant. So if you're going to apply this product, make sure that you're doing it two to, two to eight days or so after a shearing or shaping event. And the main idea behind that is we want those new buds to start forming. If you, if you just shape the tree and that, or the shrub and then go spray it, chances are those buds are not starting to expand at all. So you're probably not going to get any regulation. If you're looking at the photo thinking, well, that doesn't look like it was just sheared or shaped within a couple of days. That's correct. Not everybody wants that formal appearance. Some people like a more natural appearance. So this is where we would say, you don't always need to prune, but if you do, wait about a week. <laughs> Something to point out too is that if you do apply this product, um, do not shear, shape, or prune directly after because that's going to remove any product you just put down. So on more than a few of our research sites, we found uh, we had an error in communicating that we did not want folks to remove that product, but they did. So we, we rolled with it. And then uh, please, once again, refer to the label, but just remember that we're not looking to treat uh, maybe eight to 12 weeks between treatments. Okay, and once again, that's going to depend on a couple things. It's going to depend on the plant material, but it's also going to depend on the growing environment. So for instance, somewhere in Florida or California, where you might be getting a little bit more precip and those plants might be growing a little bit quicker um, than like Phoenix or San Diego, something like that. One of the more common questions that we get at this point is, Corey, uh, how do I price this? Well, if you're doing shrubs, you we could spend all day talking about how to price it for shrubs. But as it relates to trees, which is the more common question that we get, some people charge by species. Remember, it lasts three years. Everybody charges by DBH or by diameter of breast height. So you can either create a table or you can create a chart. We can help you do that. Um, or you could just say, hey, it's going to be 14 to $16 per inch, regardless of the species. Whatever you do, just make sure that it's something that you can replicate, that you can do throughout your organization, and that your sales guy or gal can continue to sell and price accordingly. Okay. Once again, this is as it relates to trees, this is what we're most commonly seeing. Shrubs, I mean, you, you could price it out based on species, based on property, based on ready to use gallon. Hey, the sky's the limit. Uh, you could factor it into how much time they're saving. The sky's the limit. As it relates to trees, once again, um, one gallon of product will treat roughly 52, 52 trees. So that's that's that, you know, that would be like a medium or medium low rate. All right, so let's break that down a little bit further for you. So about 400 bucks a gallon, about 10, 11 cents a mil. Follow the label. 10 inch tree will cost you about $7.72 in product cost, about 77 cents per inch. 
So if you think about it, and a lot of people like to say, well, that product's expensive and all this and that, that's actually like a third of what a lot of one or two year products are costing you. So um, remember once again, three years. So 77, so 25 cents a year to regulate plants. Of course, that's just your material cost. It does not include insurance, licenses, uh, commissions, things like that. So in conclusion, funds, um, just remember that plant growth regulators are great and you can use them for a number of things, like dozens of things, not just for growth regulation, although that does hold its place. You can also use this to improve appearance, depending on the species and the, the region that you're in, increase drought tolerance, and this is supported by a number of research projects, both in-house and done by universities. Fight diseases, some are systemic, some are foliar, and you can save time, save money, save labor costs, and all those things. And it is a safer option in many instances. Once again, please refer to your label. Um, also make sure that you're working in conjunction with the rules that your local Department of Ag has for you. If you need any support, uh, we're always happy to help you here at ArborJet. We have a number of different arborists, agronomists spread out throughout the country. All of us specialize in something and we'd rather progress the industry and help you do a better job so that you keep coming back and that you keep having predictable results for your clients. The field support's up there. Once again, if you didn't take down the names earlier, please go ahead and jot down the name. We can help, uh, Zach can drop in a link or we can get you the contact information for whomever you would like to speak with because we are here to help you, support you. As a final note, just remember that we have our early order program going on right now, and then uh, it'll be going on till the end of February. The earlier you order, the more significant your savings are. So, so don't miss out on it. Uh, another reminder, just follow us on social. Connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook. I'm sure somebody does tweeting for us. Uh, we just like to keep you informed. We post enough to stay relevant and not to annoy you. So thank you so much for showing up. Uh, Zach, any questions?